Pushkin. The global pandemic was a boom time for American billionaires who gained a trillion dollars of wealth in 2020 alone. And as CNBC reported at the height of the pandemic, one of those billionaires was fast climbing the list of the world's richest people. Elon Musk just passed Bill Gates to become the second richest man in the world with a fortune of over $128 billion. At the start of 2021, Elon Musk became the richest man in the world. Since then, he's been jockeying for the top place with other tech giants, as NBC reported this spring. Altogether, the worth of those on the list is $13.1 trillion, up from $8 trillion last year. The rise occurring as most of the world was shut down during the pandemic. Welcome to the Evening Rocket. I'm Jill Lepore. I'm a historian, a professor at Harvard. This episode, which is called Robin Hood, is the last in a series I've been hosting about a new kind of capitalism. Call it Muskism. Extravagant, extreme capitalism. Extraterrestrial capitalism. A form of capitalism influenced by fantasies that come from science fiction. During the pandemic, the contrast between the dire suffering of the masses and the vast increase of wealth among a very few cast Muskism in a particularly troubling light. In the U.S., Bernie Sanders proposed the Make Billionaires Pay Act, a one-time tax on American billionaires to help cover the out-of-pocket medical expenses of ordinary Americans for one year. Musk then got into a Twitter war with Sanders. Sanders claimed Musk's wealth had been made possible by billions of dollars in government subsidies for his corporations. Musk suggested that Sanders should leave him alone because Tesla is saving the planet. Lately, what with one thing and another, Elon Musk has been in the headlines more or less constantly. He's had phenomenal, really almost unbelievable success. The electric car revolution really does seem to be coming. And a lot of that is thanks to Tesla, to Musk's vision, and to Tesla's commitment to renewable energy. Meanwhile, Musk's other company, SpaceX, has spectacularly realized the promise of its founding with the success of rockets that go up and come down safely. They're reusable, and with SpaceX carrying astronauts to the International Space Station. Then there's Neuralink, which Musk announced has implanted a computer chip in the brain of a live pig named Gertrude. The the beeps you're hearing are real-time signals from the Neuralink in Gertrude's head. In other recent Musk news, Starlink, another SpaceX project, launched a record number of satellites, as reported by CBS News in Sacramento. Now to a string of lights streaking across Northern California tonight, and the sky lit up. Our newsroom phones lit up as well, ringing off the hook with people wondering, what are they? It seemed as though anytime Musk did anything at all, newsroom phones lit up with controversy. Those satellites were designed to bring internet service to the least networked parts of the world, but some astronomers said they were ruining the night sky. SpaceX believes these fears are overstated. And Gertrude the pig? Some neuroscientists were dubious about this experiment. One researcher telling the BBC the science was mediocre. And during the pandemic, Musk at first opposed the shutdown and vowed to keep his Tesla factory open, tweeting in all caps, Free America Now. Elon Musk is escalating his fight with the California county, restarting a Tesla factory in Fremont despite a stay-at-home order there. Then, in protest of California's strict regulations, Musk announced that he was moving to lightly regulated Texas and had decided to build Tesla's Gigafactory there, too. We approached both Tesla and SpaceX for a response on several points in the series, but at the time of the recording, we had not received a reply. If earlier Elon Musk had been Iron Man, a hybrid Silicon Valley Hollywood superhero, in 2021 he dubbed himself the Doge Father after the cryptocurrency, as if he were head of a crypto mafia. As CNBC reported, markets seemed to hang on his every word. One thing we've learned lately is that when Elon Musk tweets, uh, the news cycle follows him, and in fact he does have a series of tweets in the past few minutes says, I'm selling almost all physical possessions, will own no house. Says Tesla stock price is too high, in my opinion, and now give people back their freedom. 
it's going to get attention. Stock now down almost 7%. In the world of Muskism, a single tweet by a single person, not an announcement from a central bank, can drive a stock price or hobble a currency market. In January, after the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, Twitter banned Donald Trump. With Trump gone, Musk seemed to become the loudest voice in the room, the love-hate Twitter account to follow. If Trump's tweets destabilized American politics, Musk's tweets, as even the Doge father himself observed, seemed to be destabilizing financial markets. Meanwhile, as Musk, Bezos, Bill Gates, and Mark Zuckerberg jockeyed for first place in the world's richest man contest with inconceivably large fortunes, a lot of headlines had to do with the fictive quality of money. After all, all forms of currency are acts of imagination, as Douglas Adams pointed out so well in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In fact, there are three freely convertible currencies in the universe, but the Altarian dollar has recently collapsed, the Flanian pobble bead is only exchangeable for other Flanian pobble beads, and the Triganic pew doesn't really count as money. I started out this series with The Hitchhiker's Guide because Elon Musk read it as a kid growing up in South Africa, and he cites it all the time. Like, for instance, when he announced that he plans to name the first ship to Mars the Heart of Gold. But The Hitchhiker's Guide is also a strange influence on Muskism. Partly because Adams was so brutally, gut-wrenchingly funny about the arbitrariness of money and the foibles and follies of financial schemers and assorted idiot executives. If we could, uh, for a moment, move on to the subject of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy? Yes. How can you have money if none of you actually produce anything? It doesn't grow on trees, you know. And Adams was particularly devastating on the subject of the damage done to the natural world by advanced extractive capitalism. Since we decided a few weeks ago to adopt leaves as legal tender, we have, of course, all become immensely rich. We have also run into a small inflation problem on account of the high level of leaf availability. So um, in order to obviate this problem and effectively revalue the leaf, we are about to embark on an extensive defoliation campaign and um, uh, burn down all the forests. If you've been following the story of cryptocurrency, the scene from The Hitchhiker's Guide might sound a little too on the nose. Elon Musk had been a real booster of Bitcoin. He announced earlier this year that Tesla was buying millions of dollars of Bitcoin and that you could buy a Tesla with Bitcoin until he changed his mind, citing the sort of environmental concerns that I looked into in an earlier episode of The Evening Rocket. Turns out that mining Bitcoin really is burning down the forests. But of course, there's a backstory to Muskism's relationship to currency. So we're going to blast off to the past. The kerfuffle over Bitcoin really dates to 1848 and the discovery of gold in California. A flood of gold wreaked havoc on the U.S. dollar. And so as the federal government took on new powers, it adopted a gold standard, which set a rate for the price of paper currency. Europe then did the same thing. This ushered in a new era of global trade, and not incidentally, the grotesque economic inequality of the Gilded Age. Farmers and factory workers argued for a silver standard, but the U.S. formally established the gold standard in the year 1900. That same year, a science fiction writer named Garrett P. Service imagined a different outcome in a novel called Moon Metal, in which gold is discovered at the South Pole, setting off a second gold rush. Gold is going to be as plentiful as iron. If there were not such a flood of it, we might manage, but when they begin to make trouser buttons out of the same metal that is now locked and guarded in steel vaults, where will be our standard of worth? My dear fellow, I would as willingly face the end of the world as this that's coming. Just then, a sinister scientist discovers a mysterious new metal on the moon, which he can beam to Earth by way of a particle ray and introduces a new and more precious form of currency. I can produce it in the pure form, abundantly enough to replace gold, giving it the same relative value that gold possessed when it was the universal standard. But that will make you the richest man who ever lived. Undoubtedly. Why, you will become the financial dictator of the whole earth. Undoubtedly. Currency is always a worry. Its value is so contrived, so imaginary, but also so important. After the stock market crash of 1929, people took their money out of the banks and turned in their paper dollars for gold. In the 1930s, the U.S. abandoned the gold standard 
at least for the duration of the Depression, and prohibited the private ownership of gold. If you've been listening to the Evening Rocket for the last few episodes, you'll remember that it was during this era that in Canada, Elon Musk's grandfather joined and became a leader of the technocracy movement, founded on the belief that engineers could solve all political, social, and economic problems. Technocrats did not believe in prices. By price system is not meant merely the capitalistic system, which is only one variety of the species. It means the collapse and complete obsolescence of the entire method of distributing goods and services by means of a price. Technocrats didn't believe in prices because they didn't believe in any system not run by engineers. They wanted to get rid of both governments and banks. There will be no place for politics or politicians. Finance or financiers, rackets or racketeers. In place of prices and money, technocrats wanted to reimagine the entire economic system with a new currency, a unit of energy, an erg, whose stability would eradicate the volatility of finance. A dollar may be worth, in buying power, so much today and more or less tomorrow. But a unit of work or heat is the same in 1900, 1929, 1933, or the year 2000. The ERG never did replace the dollar, and the U.S. formally abandoned the gold standard in 1976. But starting in 2009, people who want to trade in units other than dollars can buy bitcoins. Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency, isn't based on anything of value, although not unlike the ERG, it has some relationship to energy the energy it takes to produce it. Financial analysts who talk about Bitcoin tend to refer not to the Hitchhiker's Guide, but to Peter Pan and the so-called Tinkerbell effect. All it takes is faith and trust. Oh, and something I forgot. Dust. Dust? Dust. Yup. Just a little bit of pixie dust. Bitcoin's value, like the value of other money, only exists if you believe it exists, like Tinkerbell or Neverland. Nevertheless, in a report issued earlier this year, J.P. Morgan suggested that Bitcoin is poised to become the new gold standard. Cryptocurrencies were designed to make payments without a trusted third party, such as a government or a financial institution involved. Ishwar Prasad is an economist at Cornell University and a fellow at the Brookings Institute, author of a forthcoming book on the future of money. He believes cryptocurrency has set off a revolution, a foundational change in finance, but that Bitcoin itself has not met its objectives. Bitcoin has really ended up failing in what it was supposed to provide, which is a cheap, trustless medium of exchange. It turns out it is not anonymous. It turns out it is not cheap and it is not very efficient. So Bitcoin has ended up becoming a pure speculative asset. The technology underlying cryptocurrencies, Prasad argues, will have all kinds of effects on finance. It really is the future. But he's not persuaded that, as some advocates claim, cryptocurrencies will democratize finance. They've made it possible for people with um, very low incomes, very low levels of wealth, to get relatively easy access to digital payments and also to basic banking products. But the problem is that digital access is unequal and financial literacy is unequal. So you might give people easy access to a lot of products, but if you don't teach them the risks embedded in those products, then you might end up with the relatively less well-off taking on much more risks than they realize that they're taking on, and the rich ending up being able to use these technologies much more to their advantage, so they become even better off than they are right now. One version of that story is the story of Robin Hood. When feudal barons ravaged the countryside to live in pomp and splendor, when one man alone dared challenge the might of his country's oppressors, Robin Hood. No, not that Robin Hood. This Robin Hood. Couldn't be easier to make a trade using the Robinhood app. Three taps. I just bought some stock. Earlier this year, this Robinhood, the investing app, led to a ruckus over a video game company called GameStop. A number of Wall Street firms had taken a bet that the price of GameStop 
stock would fall. And somehow a group of people on Reddit decided that they were going to take on these hedge funds and show them the power of the masses. So they basically rallied around a lot of retail investors who would start buying up GameStop stock, thereby driving up its price. So they started buying up shares, which was made possible through this Robinhood app, which allows for low cost or essentially zero commission trading. The problem, of course, is that those who got to the party late were the retail investors and they got sucked in and ended up losing a lot of money because, as you might expect, the speculative frenzy finally ended, the price of GameStop stock fell, and many of these retail investors got burned. There it is, Wendy. Second star to the right and straight on till morning. That's Peter Pan, leading the way to the island of lost boys who never grow up. Musk's fans seem to think of him less as Peter Pan, though, and more as Robin Hood. That, I think, is partly due to the story of Dogecoin, a cryptocurrency based on nothing except a meme about a dog, started by a software engineer named Jackson Palmer as a joke. Palmer later wrote an article called, My Joke Cryptocurrency Hit $2 Billion and Something is Very Wrong, in which he said cryptocurrency, for all its promise, had become nothing more than an unregulated penny stock market. Musk hadn't been much involved in all of this, but in 2019, after people started tweeting that he should be the CEO of Dogecoin, he said it was his favorite cryptocurrency. Dogecoin's value skyrocketed. Then, in a kind of quintessential act of Muskism, Musk kept tweeting about it, and up went its price. This past February, Musk talked about Dogecoin on Clubhouse, a kind of audio chat room popular in Silicon Valley. Occasionally I make jokes about Dogecoin. They are really just meant to be joke, but Dogecoin was made as a joke to make fun of cryptocurrencies, obviously. But fate loves irony. <laughs> and, and often, as a friend of mine says, the most ironic outcome is most likely, or I say the most entertaining outcome is often the most likely. And arguably, the most entertaining outcome and the most ironic outcome would be that Dogecoin becomes the, the currency of Earth in the future. The future, the future. But to me, beneath the thunder of rocket engines and far from the glare of computer screens, there's something medieval going on here. Even calling a cryptocurrency a coin is kind of a throwback. So I called up a medievalist named Rory Naismith, who teaches at Cambridge. I asked him how people in the Middle Ages trusted money. You can trust the people behind it. And that's important. They think about money very much in personal terms. These coins are very often issued in the name of a king or a bishop or someone like that. That's one side of it. There's a strong sense that money is precious metal. It's not quite worth its weight in gold or silver, at least not always, mm -hmm. but that is still there as a kind of, kind of fallback. So there's a degree of abstraction that we put our trust in the identity of the person whose face is on the coin, say. But there's also a degree of real concrete value. Was, you could melt this thing down, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And right down to the 17th, 18th century, people thought of their silverware, their forks, their plates, all that sort of thing, as, in a very real sense, another kind of money. Then, of course, came paper money and banks and the nation state and the growth of state power and government regulation of currency, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve. It's as if some advocates of cryptocurrency some of whom use an investing app named after a mythical medieval character, want to uninvent all of those things. They want to go back to a time before those things were invented, to a fantasy Middle Ages where the currency is coin and Robin Hood is stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. In a way, it's also a bit like, not necessarily just the future of money, but also going back to the past of money. It's, it's quite like going back to this period in the the Middle Ages, when you thought much more in terms of people and sources rather than bigger states and bigger institutions that would underpin the authority and trustworthiness of these coins. To me, in Sherwood Forest, Elon Musk isn't Robin Hood. He's the king whose face is on the coin. In Musk, we trust. In February, Musk tweeted the single word, Doge, under a picture of a SpaceX rocket in front of the moon. Doge to the moon became a rallying cry. This was all a performance, a joke, topsy-turvy, like a medieval carnival. Musk would tweet outrageous things, then say he was only joking. On April Fool's Day, he tweeted, 
SpaceX is going to put a literal Dogecoin on the literal moon. A joke, but also not a joke. Musk said that SpaceX will be accepting Dogecoin as payment, with one Doge-funded launch scheduled next year. Meanwhile, Tesla was in the news for investing in and accepting Bitcoin, and then in the news for walking all that back. Days later, NBC's Saturday Night Live announced that Musk would host an upcoming episode. It aired on Mother's Day Eve. Musk brought his mother onto the stage and told her his present for her was Dogecoin. In his opening monologue, Musk announced that he has Asperger's syndrome. Look, I know I sometimes say or post strange things, but that's just how my brain works. To anyone I've offended, I just want to say, I reinvented electric cars and I'm sending people to Mars in a rocket ship. (laughs) Did you think I was also going to be a chill, normal dude? (laughs) Some people in the autism community celebrated Musk's announcement as a milestone. And as some autistic writers observed, there was something very moving when he joked that he was pretty good at running human in emulation mode. Elsewhere, Musk has joked that he's an alien or a robot, other ways that he's conjured a struggle experienced by many people on the autism spectrum who've been forced to mask their very selves. But there were critics, too, who maintained that Musk's announcement was deeply cynical and just another element of an anything-goes capitalism. In Slate magazine, journalist Sarah Luderman, who is autistic, objected to a billionaire using Asperger's to insulate himself from criticism of his business practices, writing, Apparently, Asperger's syndrome means never having to say you're sorry. What struck me, though, is that Musk's monologue made out as if people who criticize him object to him personally. But it has never been my sense that serious people who criticize Musk do so because they object to his tone or his mode of expression. The quarrel isn't with what he says or how he says it, but with what he does and with the world he seems to want to build. The quarrel isn't with Musk, but with Muskism. To Luderman's point, appearing on SNL gave Musk all sorts of opportunities to tell a new, redemptive story about himself. He appeared in nearly every sketch. As the Nintendo villain Wario on trial for murdering Mario, he explained, I'm not evil, I'm just misunderstood. In a skit set in the Old West, he played a bandit named Leron, What if instead of panning for gold, we just create our own currency? (laughs) Currency? Uh, yeah. And what the heck would it be based on? Whatever we say it's based on. That ain't how money works! (laughs) Money is a golden rock that we dig out of the ground. Then we hope no one kills us before we trade it for pieces of green paper. It's a perfect system! It's a weird thing about being a historian. Everything reminds you of something else. Watching Elon Musk play Leron dressed like a cowboy, he looked exactly like an old photograph of his grandfather, the technocrat, who worked as a cowboy and performed at rodeos doing rope tricks. The family likeness is uncanny. Musk is also named after that cowboy's father, his great-grandfather, Elon. Muskism asks us to picture always the future, but I find it hard not to keep picturing the past, yanked back, lassoed, by likenesses. On SNL, Musk appeared, too, on the show's newscast as a cryptocurrency expert who can't give a straight answer. What is Dogecoin? Well, it actually started as a joke based on an internet meme. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what is Dogecoin? Finally, he admits the truth. I keep telling you, it's a cryptocurrency you can trade for conventional money. Oh, so it's a hustle. Yeah, it's a hustle. (laughs) That night, Dogecoin lost a third of its value. Me, I was left thinking about the ending to that old science fiction story, the Moon Medal, from the year 1900. The looting of the moon brought disaster to the robber planet. So mad were the efforts to get the precious metal that the surface of our globe was fairly showered with it. The air was filled with shining dust until finally... Famine and pestilence joined hands with financial disaster to punish the grasping world. At the end of Moon Metal, markets collapse until an international agreement leads to government control of the currency. Some people think this is what's most likely to happen to cryptocurrency, too. Meantime, 
the air is being filled with shining pixie dust as famine and pestilence and pandemic join hands with financial disaster to punish the grasping world. This is an age of technological wonder and entrepreneurial experimentation. It is in many ways tremendously thrilling. SpaceX and Tesla engineering marvels. As social engineering, though, I don't find any of this thrilling. The people with the most money shouldn't get to decide what happens on Earth or on the moon or to the skies or on Mars or anywhere. To me, the larger story about the rise of Muskism, extravagant, extreme, fantastical capitalism, is its anachronism. I can't tell you anything about the future of Muskism, but it strikes me that for all its obsession with the future, Muskism is trapped in the past. Elon Musk is a visionary, but what I've come to believe during the research for this series is that those visions come from a future first imagined in science fiction long, long ago. Decades, sometimes more than a century ago. Rockets to Mars, electric cars, cryptocurrency. A future without governments or banks. A future where engineers and scientists and only engineers and scientists have the answers. A future whose long-dead authors very often pictured a world where the poor and the powerless and the robots know their place. And it is to serve the powerful quietly and obediently and without daring to claim sovereignty or independence or even intelligence. This future was imagined by a very tiny number of men during an age of imperialism, before women could vote, an age of staggering economic inequality and brutal racial injustice, an age of pandemic disease, unraveling democracies, and world war. present is tough, but that past is past, and I don't want it ever to be the future again. The Evening Rocket was written and read by me, Jill Lepore. For the BBC, The Evening Rocket was produced by Viv Jones. Oliver Riskin Cuts was the researcher. The editor was Hugh Levinson. The commissioning editor was Dan Clark. Iona Hammond was production coordinator. Mixing by Graham Putafoot and original music by Corntooth. For Pushkin, it was produced by Sophie Crane McKibben and Jake Gorski, who also did the mix and sound design. Production support from Ben Natafafri. Our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Our operations team includes Daniela Lacan, Maya Koenig, and Carly Migliori. Thanks also to John Schnars, Jacob Weisberg, Maggie Taylor, Heather Fain, Nicole Moreno, and Eric Sandler.